This talk is going to look at two questions. Why do we need to move to more optical interconnects deeper inside machines? And given that we understand those reasons, in broad terms, how are we going to do that? Or more specifically, what is it that we need to do to get there? I should emphasise that this will not primarily be a talk about specific technologies. Rather, it will be a talk about what kinds of things we need to work on and why we need to do that. And the talk will give you convincing reasons why we should indeed invest our time and money in doing this. There is much good news. We are not waiting on any new physics. There really is no alternative to this optical path. And the things we need to do are things we would want to do anyway. But there are some surprises, including some major changes in emphasis and in the way that we think. And interestingly, there's at least one thing we need to stop doing. There are two major reasons why we have to push more optics deeper inside machines. The first is to get the necessary bandwidth density for all those interconnects. And the second is to reduce energy. Here we'll talk mostly about energy, but the potential of optics for the bandwidth density turns out to be so enormous that we can also use the advantages of optics to help reduce energy. First, the physical argument on density is very simple. It comes from a basic problem of electrical wires. So let's look at that one first. The basic density problem of electrical interconnect wiring can be summed up quite simply. Here I'm showing a small wire. I've shown it as a wire above a ground plane, but it doesn't matter what type of wire we think about here. The point is that this small wire carries the same number of bits per second as this larger wire. That is, as we scale the wiring up, or indeed as we scale it down, we don't allow ourselves to carry any more information on the wires. It's a scale invariant property of the capacity of wires, big and small. This has been known for some time, and this particular article is one description of it. So this gives us a universal form of scaling for simple digital interconnections with electrical wiring. When I say simple, I mean we're not talking here about repeaters or multi-level modem techniques, and one can do all those things, although they add complexity and energy. We can sum it up in a simple formula. The bit rate that we can get down a system of wiring is proportional to the total cross-sectional area of the wiring divided by the square of the length of the wiring. Now that applies to one wire, if we think of this here as the cross-section of this wire, for example, A, and this is the length, or it also applies to collections of wires. The prefactor in front of here is quite large. In bits per second, it's of the order of 10 to the 15 or even 10 to the 16. But it soon comes to cause us problems. And we see this particular limitation all the time in integrated circuits and in boards and in cabinets and a wiring between cabinets. So we can state this the following way. Once the wiring fills all space, the capacity can't be increased either by making the system smaller or by making it larger. For once, miniaturization does not help us. Optics completely avoids this scaling limitation because it has no resistive loss and because of its small wavelength. And I'll come back to optical limits later. As I said, this limit shows itself at all levels of electrically interconnected systems, from chips to cabinets. The wiring tends to fill all the available space, and indeed most of the fabricated volume in an electronic chip is actually wiring, not transistors. This limit, as I said, does not apply at all to optics, and optics effectively beats it by many orders of magnitude in practice. And as I said, I'll have more to say later about what the limits are in optical systems, or more positively, what are the opportunities for truly massive numbers of channels in optics? For the moment, let's turn our attention to the question of energy in interconnects, and energy in general in information processing machines. This question is critical if we are to continue to scale up information processing. 
and recent developments in machine learning and artificial intelligence are only increasing the demand and the required rate at which processing capacity must increase. A key point is that most of the energy inside machines is actually the energy to run interconnects. It's not logic energy. And that energy we're talking about is significant. We need to generate and dissipate massive amounts of energy in large machines, such as data centers. And overall, we're using something like 5 to 10% of all electricity just in processing and communicating information. These are large numbers, and they also leave little room for scaling up the size of systems. I'm arguing here that the scarce resource inside large machines is becoming energy. And that's mostly used for sending information, and I'll justify that. And especially for the large number of short distance communications inside racks and boards and even chips themselves. The problem is we're getting stuck at picojoules per bit or more for all communications off chips and for longer distances. Why is this? After all, we now have many demonstrations of optoelectronics that are operating at, say, 1 to 10 femtojoules per bit of energy. So, is there any path then to 10 femtojoules per bit of total system energy, not just optoelectronic device energy, for off-chip interconnect, while still retaining and expanding the very large required bandwidth densities we're going to have? A talk like this contains a lot of information, and I don't have time to go through all the detail. Fortunately, there are two major references here that will help with that. The first is the paper most associated with this talk on energies and systems and device physics, and then specifically on waves and channels for optical communications, this second paper gives a deep review. I should also say that if you would like an electronic copy of these slides, I'm very happy to send them to you. Please just send me an email. Now, I've said that we are using picojoules per bit for off-chip communications. Why is that? Well, when we do electrical interconnects, the answer to that is very simple. In electrical systems, it's because we're charging wires, and centimeters of wires have picofarads of capacitance, and we take picojoules of energy to charge them up. In optical systems, there are really three reasons why we're using so much energy. First of all, because we have not yet integrated optoelectronics and electronics closely enough and with low enough capacitance. And that's especially true for photodetectors. We really want to reduce the capacitance with which we integrate photodetectors. Secondly, because we have not yet invested enough in the technology, we need low energy optoelectronics and technologies such as germanium quantum well modulators in silicon photonics are quite possible, but they're not yet technologically available in production processes. But a technology like that could solve a lot of problems for energy. And we also have not invested enough in the specific optics that we really need. Specifically then, we need very low loss optical couplers to make this job easier. And we also need to look at array optics, I mean two-dimensional arrays of light beams and the optics that would handle that. And the third one is a surprising one, perhaps. We use picojoules because we waste picojoules per bit in the circuits that drive and receive signals. And I'll talk about that as well. This table here shows the energies per bit for many different operations we encounter in handling information all the way from long distance communications here down to even the energies required for logic operations in a gate, which are on the scale of a femtojoule, possibly less, possibly more. But the numbers I'm most interested in here are really these ones. Again, we see here communicating off chip is something that takes picojoules to possibly tens of picojoules for every bit. And also note data multiplexing and timing circuits take picojoules per bit. A complicated logic operation, such as a floating point multiplication per bit, only consumes about 100 femtojoules, and the energy stored in a DRAM cell is of the order of 10 femtojoules, but the energy to read out a DRAM cell is about 5 picojoules. 
The dominant point here is that most energy is used for communications, not logic. And that's true even inside machines and all the way down to chips and below. These energies of hundreds of femtojoules or more for longer on-chip interconnections, up to picojoules or more for off-chip connections, can therefore dominate in chip dissipation. Note too that now chips may have possibly tens of terabits of communication internally and possibly also terabits of bandwidth off the chip too. Because of the higher overall data rates on such short connections, the energies of those can actually dominate. Though it does take more energy to send a bit over longer distances, there is massively more information sent at shorter distances, so much so that most energy dissipation is in shorter links and interconnects inside machines. To understand the comparison between logic and communications energy, we can look right inside the chip and compare logic and wiring capacitance. To run a logic gate, we have to charge the transistors inside it. But we also have to charge the wires that communicate in and out of the gate. But the wiring capacitance, even to neighbouring gates, is of the same size as, or larger than, the transistor capacitance. So most energy in information processing is in communications rather than in logic. And that's true even at the level of individual gates. Most communication goes further than that and we have to spend proportionately more energy for all longer distances on chip and still more energy for off chip. Hence, most energy dissipation in information processing is in charging and discharging wire capacitance, which is about 2 picofarads per centimetre, or 200 attofarads per micron. So just touching a bit typically costs us many femtojoules in CMOS because of the combination of the logic and wiring capacitances that we have to charge and discharge. Simple logic level signalling results therefore in large dissipation. For a wire capacitance C, we dissipate at least a quarter CV squared, where V is the voltage, per bit in on-off signalling. So for example, at this 2 picofarads per centimetre wire capacitance and a 2 centimetre chip, at 1 volt on-off signalling, the energy per bit communicated is at least a picojoule. And that agrees with the energy required to send information across a chip. So then, the dominant energy dissipation in short distances inside machines is charging and discharging wire capacitance. So how can we physically save energy with optics? Well, to save energy in the physical process of communications itself, we should stop wasting energy in charging and discharging electrical lines. And that's where optics comes in. This is a fundamental quantum mechanical advantage of optics, which is called quantum impedance conversion. And that is simply, we end up charging the photodetector and essentially not the wire. To understand this basic idea of quantum impedance conversion, we can imagine that we're shining a light beam into a photodetector and that we've connected the photodetector in a simple circuit with a load resistor. The photoelectric effect means that we can generate a large voltage in a detector, for example, a fraction of a volt, even with very little signal power or energy, and with very little classical voltage in the light beam. For example, a one nanowatt light beam has a classical voltage less than one millivolt. But nonetheless, through the photoelectric effect, we can generate a fraction of a volt in a load resistor. Optics only has to charge the photodetector and the transistor to the logic voltage. It does not have to charge the light beam or the waveguide to the logic voltage. To exploit this quantum impedance conversion, therefore, we should first of all make sure that we reduce the energy required to run the optoelectronic devices so that the energy to send information optically becomes less than that required to send it on wires. And that should be true, hopefully, even for short distances down to centimetres or possibly shorter than that. Integrating sub-femtofarad photodetectors right beside transistors can reduce the front-end capacitance that I've called CFE here. Note that as we look at this in more detail, we find that the system energy, the total energy per bit, 
tends to go down in proportion as this capacitance is reduced. Reducing this capacitance is as important, for example, as increasing laser efficiency, and there is more headroom here. We can't have a 1000% efficient laser, but we can reduce this capacitance by a factor of 10 or even a factor of 100. We should also push the operating energies of output devices into the sub 10 femtojoule range. So we're looking for low energy modulators, lasers, or even light emitting diodes. We could exploit nanophotonic structures, and we should certainly try to use the strongest mechanisms we have for running these devices. For example, quantum confined Stark effect electroabsorption in germanium quantum wells is a particularly energy efficient mechanism, and this technology could be developed. And it is indeed much stronger than other mechanisms that we have about, including those in two dimensional materials that are of some current interest. In this table here, I'm showing the capacitance of various small structures. First of all, a conventional photodiode, which might be 100 by 100 microns, for example, would have a capacitance of about one picofarad. A small photodetector of, say, 5 by 5 microns might have a capacitance of a few femtofarads. A small cube of semiconductor, say a 1 micron cube, would have an intrinsic capacitance of the order of 100 attofarads. The input capacitance of a field effect transistor in CMOS is likely to be on the scale of tens to hundreds of attofarads, depending upon its size. And the capacitance of a micron of wire is about 200 attofarads or so. The key point of this is that if we want to get small energies, we need small capacitances, then we need small devices, which themselves have low device capacitance, and we need very close integration. The length scale over which we need to integrate is of the order of microns or less if we want to keep the total capacitances of the system below of the order of few femtofarads. This figure shows an example of quantum confined Stark effect electroabsorption in germanium quantum wells. So here are the electroabsorption spectra here the absorption as a function of wavelength for various different voltages. And here's a picture of that device. This device is of the order of 10 microns long. It's built on silicon and note it requires no resonator, so there's nothing else to tune here. The growth of this structure in silicon and insulator waveguides gives capacitances of a few femtofarads, and the dynamic energy per bit to run this is of the order of 0.75 femtojoules. The total energy would be somewhat larger than that, but it's still on a femtojoule scale. This work was published a few years ago, and recently there's been progress towards foundry fabrication of this kind of device. So, there are mechanisms that can get us to femtojoule levels in optical output devices. This germanium quantum well mechanism is one that is ready for development for integration. Other recent interest has included two-dimensional materials and plasmonic structures that can concentrate light for greater efficiency. All of these could be interesting. A key point here is that we therefore have the physics and device concepts for efficient low-energy optoelectronic output devices. But now we need to turn to another major source of energy dissipation, and one that could be much larger than these device energies. So now let's look at the circuit energies. If the dissipation in the associated circuits is large, then low energy optoelectronic devices cannot be exploited effectively. So we should stop wasting energy in the electrical circuits we use to run interconnects. For example, in optics, the first thing we could do would be to eliminate the receiver amplifier circuit dissipation. That's typically in the range of hundreds of femtojoules per bit to even picojoules per bit. How could we do that? Well, the key is integrating low capacitance photodetectors close to or beside the transistors. This may eliminate the need for voltage amplification altogether, and we could call that receiverless operation, or perhaps the optimum is about one simple low energy gain stage for near receiverless operation. The energies for receiverless operation are quite interesting to look at. Suppose, for example, that the optical signal we receive is of the order of one femtojoules worth of received optical energy. 
then that would generate about one femtocoulomb of charge. So in a one picofarad conventional photodetector, that would generate only about one millivolt of signal. In a solder-bumped photodetector, which might have the order of 30 femtofarads of capacitance, that would generate about 33 millivolts of signal. But if we have a one femtofarad integrated photodetector, we can generate some decent fraction of a volt of signal with no amplification whatsoever. So here, for example, are some photodetectors shown integrated right beside the gate of a transistor. That would be a rather difficult monolithic kind of integration, but merely integrating up to electronics close to the transistors within a few microns should be enough here. That allows excess capacitance in the scale of only hundreds of attofarads, and hence a total input capacitance of one femtofarad or so or lower. So we have concluded that with low energy optoelectronic output devices that we could likely make, and with micron sized photodetectors, and with all of these devices integrated within a few microns of the electronics, we could largely get in and out of electronic logic levels and the optoelectronic input and output components with femtojoule or possibly tens of femtojoules of total energy per bit. But now we have to start looking at more circuit energies and confront one of the major sources of energy per bit. Time multiplexing takes energy. For example, picojoules per bit in CERDES or serializer, deserializer circuits. Why does time multiplexing take energy? First of all, because we touch a bit many times to time multiplex or demultiplex it. For example, we move it in registers and buffers. If we estimate something on the scale of 1 to 100 femtojoules per bit for every time we touch a bit, we quickly get to picojoule per bit energies. Because we run some of the circuits at very high speed, we have a second reason why we take more energy in time multiplexing, because such high speeds require even more energy per bit operation. And thirdly, because we also have to perform clock and data recovery, or CDR for synchronization, we take more energy. That process similarly takes picojoules per bit in those circuits. If we go on to look at other things we might do in links, for example, the use of advanced multi-level signaling, that only requires more circuitry and energy. Any use of error correction only requires more circuitry and energy. So time multiplexing and advanced signaling to get more information per channel only make the energy per bit problem worse. Why do we use such circuits? There are two reasons. First of all, because we think we're limited by the number of available channels for interconnection. For example, the number of fibers. That forces a maximum wavelength multiplexing, but also time multiplexing. And secondly, because we think we cannot run large systems synchronously, so we need the clock and data recovery. But neither of these beliefs are actually correct. Now, of course, time multiplexing is very useful, especially for longer links where we do indeed have limited numbers of optical fibres. And I'm certainly not suggesting we stop doing that for such long links. But once we look at short links, for example between chips or inside a machine, we need to minimise our use of time multiplexing. Indeed, in electrical memory bus structures inside electronic machines, we generally avoid time multiplexing using parallelism as much as possible. We should also understand that in electrical wiring, we are in practice forced to do more clock and data recovery than we would like, and that is due to another weakness of electrical interconnections. This weakness also strongly influences the way we design large electronic systems in a way that necessarily increases energy. With optics, we can avoid this weakness, which opens new opportunities for system design. There's another rather subtle problem with electrical wiring. Essentially, time delays are not predictable in electronics with electrical wiring, and that means we have to use clock and data recovery quite a lot. There are two reasons for this. One is that electrical wiring does not have much signal bandwidth, and that means that trying to propagate a very precise clock edge or a precise pulse down it it simply does not arrive as a precise pulse at the far end. It's spread out 
by the effective bandwidth of the wiring. So we can't easily propagate very precise clock edges, for example. Secondly, the temperature coefficient of the resistance of copper and of other metals is sufficiently large that the wire's resistance varies quite a lot with temperature. That means that rise times are not very predictable, and that means again that the effective signal propagation velocity is really quite variable with temperature. So with electrical wiring, we really need to do a lot of clock and data recovery. In contrast, in optics, time delays are very predictable. For example, even for a 10 meter long fibre over 100 degrees centigrade or Celsius of temperature variation, there would be less than 10 picoseconds variation in the arrival time of a pulse. And of course, the pulse itself could propagate down the fibre with essentially no distortion whatsoever. And in free space, there is no such variation with temperature at all. Free space optics also has equal paths even for very large numbers of beams. So optical systems can deliver very large numbers of paths with equal timing and with predictable timing. For a precision even much less than one clock cycle, in optics we would only need path lengths controlled to of the order of a centimetre. Cutting fibre to lengths or in free space imaging, that's quite easy to accomplish. We could run 10 meter scale systems with all delays being an integer number of clock cycles without any clock phase recovery. So optics offers us the possibility of running very large synchronous systems and hence getting rid of a lot of that clocking and clock and data recovery energy. So as we think about interconnects inside the system from the edge of the chip up to distances of say of the order of 10 meters, we can think of systems differently if we use optics, eliminating much of the energy associated with clock and data recovery, and possibly also that associated with time multiplexing. But wait, you might say, how are we going to get enough channels to send all the information if we don't use time multiplexing? There is an answer to this question, and indeed it has been quite extensively and successfully researched. There is a direction we can take that offers us a factor of thousand or ten thousand or even more at no energy cost. That direction is to use space, that is to use the massive number of spatial channels available in optics. We are all aware of a very common example, which is the camera in your cell phone. This handles many millions of spatial channels, or pixels in this case, in a tiny piece of optics that fits in your pocket. In that case, we are using imaging optics to connect the millions of different points in the scene we are looking at, one by one, to the pixels in the camera. Incidentally, even some time ago, optically connected digital systems with over 50,000 channels were successfully demonstrated. The basic technology for generating and handling thousands of light beams has been available for several decades or more. It includes things like diffractive optic spot array generators to create arrays of light beams, and lenslet arrays to reshape the individual beams if needed, as well as, of course, conventional imaging optics of lenses, mirrors and prisms. So therefore, I'm arguing that we should look again at array optics. That is, the concept of moving to free space optical systems with thousands to tens of thousands of connections avoiding time multiplexing and all those CERDES and CDR energies, so we can run at low energy efficient clock rates. That is, for example, a few gigahertz to of the order of 10 gigahertz, clock rates that are directly compatible with efficient silicon digital chips. I appreciate this may seem like a radical solution, but in my view it's not really that radical. We could do this now if we chose to engineer it. And this really is the only way I know of that offers us three to five orders of magnitude at relatively little cost and allows us to eliminate large amounts of energy dissipation. The physics of the number of available channels in free space systems is relatively straightforward, though possibly it's less well known than it ought to be and there has been a lot of confusion about this recently. So let's clarify this issue of the number of channels available next. So let's look at this issue of how many spatial channels there are for communicating between two surfaces. We imagine that we have 
a transmitting surface of area AT and a receiving surface of area AR. Then the number of possible optical channels, spatial channels, per polarization between two surfaces of these areas, separated by some distance L, at a wavelength lambda, is limited by diffraction to give this number of channels, which is the product of the two areas divided by the square of the separation and the square of the wavelength. The derivation of this is given in some detail in this reference here. For example, at one micron wavelength, for two surfaces each of area 10 by 10 centimeters separated by 10 meters, there would be 10 to the 6 possible spatial channels. So that's like having two telephoto lenses staring at one another over a distance of 10 meters. That optical system could handle 10 to the 6, a million spatial channels. Suppose we look then not at such a rack-to-rack -rack communication, but at chip-to-chip -chip communication, so on a centimeter scale. Then, for example, for two surfaces separated by a couple of centimeters and using two by two millimeter areas on those surfaces as the optical areas, then we would get four times 10 to the four possible channels. Now, we should make some comment here about orbital angular momentum beams, because there's been a lot of confusion about this topic. The conclusions we have come to here about the numbers of channels available for communicating are not changed if we add in the idea of orbital angular momentum beams or modes. Orbital angular momentum is not an additional degree of freedom in optics beyond the existing spatial degrees of freedom. For usual optical systems, we can get just as many orthogonal channels using beams with no angular momentum at all, and the proof of that is given here. So, given that we are thinking about the somewhat radical idea of free space optics, let's get some sense of what that means technologically. Roughly, how would we implement that? As I said, we can easily generate large arrays of light beams from one source. We've been doing that with diffractive optics for at least 30 years. Free space beam arrays, as I said, have the same time delay to within picosecond levels over millions of pixels. You might think it's hard to align an entire array of light beams, but in fact, it's not much more difficult than aligning one beam. We just have to add array orientation, the twist of the array, and overall array dilation, that's the overall size of the array. If necessary, we could servo the alignment in free space arrays, which we can do in optics, even in physically very demanding situations. Think of the servoing of the optics in a CD or DVD player, which holds a position within a micron on a spinning disc. We could imagine such servoing for longer distance links, such as between boards or cabinets. For shorter distances, for example between chips, we could simply make rigid optics. We could make essentially a small rectangular rod of plastic, incorporating any lenses or mirrors or prisms. Just to give some sense of what might happen if we tried to connect, say, a thousand channels from one chip to another, coming out of the surface of the chip, then we might have 10 by 10 micron optical pads, as it were, on the surface of the chip. So these could be grading cuppers. Now, if we pack them closely together, that would take up some area of the order of 320 microns by 320 microns. But more realistically, we would probably space them out. For example, if we space them center to center by something of the order of 30 microns, then we could still couple down to the small pads down here, but using lenslets, we can effectively make the beam larger and easier for the optical system to align the whole array with precision, and hence transform to give still only one by one square millimeters, but still having of the order of a thousand channels in and out. This is only meant to be a rough order of magnitude concept here, but the idea is there is plenty of space on the surface of a chip for coming out with many thousands of optical outputs and in an array that we could image over to some other chip with conventional imaging optics. To give some sense of how this would all be put together, I put together a straw man system. So this is sketched over here at various different levels from photodetectors possibly beside transistors, 
up through the wiring layers of the integrated circuit to an optical interposer layer, a silicon photonics layer, which you see in light blue in these various parts of this complicated diagram. So a key additional technology to make this work is indeed some integration, which should be at least hybrid, and a silicon photonics interposer layer would be particularly useful. We would put the optoelectronics mostly or totally in this layer and hybridize that directly on top of some silicon integrated circuit. With this, we'd be able to implement the ideas I'm talking about. And that silicon photonics interposer layer would work particularly well if we added some materials to it, for example, germanium for germanium quantum wells, or possibly three fives, because then we could easily get to the energies we're looking for in the optoelectronic devices without having to use high Q resonators, for example. And as I said, we would put detectors beside the transistors or in the photonics interposer layer on top. We would also want improved optical couplers in this system. So things like optical vias, perhaps, through the silicon wiring layer, but certainly waveguide arrays and, most importantly, efficient free space couplers. The goal here is to get to 10 femtojoules per bit of total system energy up to, say, 10 metres of distance. Note that this straw man system I put together here predicts that even with 19 decibels of total optical system loss, that's what I put into the calculation, 10 femtojoules per bit is still achievable. Note incidentally that 10 femtojoules per bit implies only 10 milliwatts of power dissipation for one terabit per second of interconnect bandwidth. So what's the bad news? Well, the bad news is time multiplexing is not the solution for low energy. We may need to change to synchronous systems. We may need to change the way we use optics, introducing highly parallel free space systems, for example. And we need to invest in new technologies. But the good news is, first of all, we don't need any new physics. The mechanisms we already have are more than good enough. We know what technology we need. We need to integrate low capacitance detectors close to transistors. We need to implement low energy output devices like modulators. We need to implement array optics and we need to improve couplers. But we would want to implement much of this technology anyway. We have orders of magnitude possible improvement available to us. We really can eliminate the picojoule per bit circuit energies. Free space optics really does allow thousands or tens of thousands of channels. We really could change from 1 to 10 picojoules per bit to 10 to 100 femtojoules per bit. That's total energy for all interconnects from 1 centimetre to 10 metres. And finally, there's no competition. The only way of doing this is to use optics to increase the bandwidth and reduce the energy for off-chip interconnects. Thank you for your attention.